Now who would like more buck numbers this year for hunting season? Maybe some more buck numbers in September, October, November, more bucks on camera. Um, there's a lot of different factors to that. And, and I, I have videos out there and articles talking about how to explode your buck numbers, but I'm gonna focus on one very, very important concept when it comes to building a lot of buck numbers. And it's not that you're building buck numbers from bucks that are born on your land as fawns you're collecting bucks. And so when you're collecting bucks, it's very important to understand that whether bucks are fawns or they're yearling bucks, and a yearling buck is not a fawn, a fawn is not a yearling, that's important to understand. They call it a yearling because it's a buck that's in its first year, it's a yearling, it's a year and a half old, it's whatever, it's a year and three months old, it's a year and five months old, that's a yearling. Uh, fawn is a fawn. It's born this year. Um, if you're in October, that fawn is born in June. Five months old, four months old, whatever it is, that's a fawn. Um, but at some point, fawns in big ag area where they don't have to winter, they don't have to learn those deer yards, you find that fawns are kicked out by their mother in those areas. And on average, whether it's a fawn or it's a yearling buck that's in a big woods setting that needs to know those migration routes, needs to understand and learn those, those wintering areas. Those areas are not instinctual, they're actually taught and they're learned, learned behavior. So those fawns or yearlings, when they're kicked out of the herd due to female social pressure from their mothers, they're gonna travel an average of three quarters of a mile to establish their new ground and establish where they're actually gonna end up as an older adult buck. And that can be up to a mile and a half. So there's a big range that yearling bucks will go, and what do you think they're searching for? I want you to ask yourself, here's a yearling buck, here's a fawn buck that was just kicked out of the herd by its mother. So when that deer is kicked out and that buck, what do you think he's looking for? Well, of course he's looking for good habitat, he's looking for good food sources, he's looking for good cover sources, he's looking for an area where he's not gonna be intruded on by man. But once he finds all those locations, what happens if those areas are dominated by doe family groups and female social pressure. He doesn't stick. So if on your land you have huge numbers of does and fawns, they take over everything, you have that traditional doe factory that I originated and talked about and experienced and defined, um, if you have too many does, those traveling yearling bucks and buck fawns are not gonna stick to your property. They're gonna be pushed away due to female social pressure. It doesn't matter how good your habitat is, doesn't matter how good your cover is, your food sources. In fact, that can kill you. Because if you have great summer food, you have great fall and winter habitat, you have high stem counts, you're gonna create great fawning doe, doe factory, and you're gonna have a big bumper of does and fawns that are sitting over your property like a bubble so that every traveling yearling buck that comes into it gets repelled, but you can turn it around. I'm here to tell you that. You know, in the UP of Michigan, I started with my land in 99 had 10 acres with another 120 acres behind it. It was not uncommon to travel for five days on the two and a half miles of sand trails and two tracks from logging on that property and not see a deer track. During the first fall in 99, I got a picture of one spike. I got two to three pictures of them and that was it. And I found one rub, one scrape. That was it on the whole property. And I looked a lot because I love to run beagles. So I was out there all winter long uh, I spent a lot of time in the property. It was right behind the house. You can imagine, like some of you, it's hard to resist the temptation to go out on property that's right behind your house, but not a lot of sign at all. Fast forward to 2006, had pictures of 17 different bucks. I passed up 11 and I shot two. So 13 out of those 17 I saw. And those bucks were on that property in an area that averages a half a fawn per doe going into the fall, and half of those fawns die during the winter. So you're looking at, it takes four does to create one buck fawn going into the springtime. And I created that property, and I created that buck herd by attracting yearling bucks, and here's how you do it. Again, easy to repel them. That's what most people do, that's what most properties do. If you have too many does and fawns, those yearling bucks come through, they don't stick, they don't stay on your land, and people wonder, where do all these yearling bucks go? They go to the properties that have a balanced number of does and have multiple food sources and multiple bedding areas and hidden food sources. That's how you attract those yearling bucks. So let me give you an example of a, a square property here. And I'll just show you, square property, 
let's say there is a giant food plot down in this corner. We don't care what size this property is. We're not even gonna talk about this. Let's look at it that this is all open timber going out here. Let's say you have a nice little swamp out in the corner here of this property. Some lowland. So with that swamp and with that diversity of habitat, you have some cover back here. That's a good thing. Uh, maybe you have a pine thicket down here that's been blown or like an old scotch pine, like an old Christmas tree farm where there's a lot of briars and garbage coming in. So it gives some cover, not necessarily because of the pines, but because the pines were established. They took over that area. They're starting to break down. Briars are coming into it and it creates this thick mess. There's pieces of the pine coming down. Scotch pine are not very long lived tree, like a white pine that can live 400, 400 years. So now you have a little bit of cover here, a little bit of cover around here. This is a pond. The rest is hardwoods. So what does that mean? It means that if does are on this land, they're going to be in this layer right around here. You can have does around here. You might have some does around here. And then you might have some scattered does pockets out here. If you're in a big deer density area, you could fit a lot of, a lot of deer on this parcel. And they're going to be in the form of does and fawns because there's simply no room for bucks left over. You have the food there, pushing that. Can you imagine when a yearling buck comes onto this property or is traveling through, he's been pushed away because of female social pressure. He goes out into this big open food plot and a doe family group sees him. I bet you'll have subordinate does coming over to kick him off, let alone a dominant doe stamping, stomping and looking at him. It doesn't matter if he's a year and a half old or a fawn. He's not going to stick to that land. He's not going to like it too much. He was just kicked out of the herd due to female social pressure. Last thing he wants to do is come onto a property like this. Take this same property, regardless of the size. This could be a 620 acre parcel. This could be a 40. This could be a 10. You're creating hinge cut bedding area here. Maybe you're harvesting the timber. Maybe you're taking out some big old soft maples and you're allowing that sunlight to come down because you're opening up 60% of the canopy. You're leaving some of that debris and log down on the ground. You're opening it up so deer can actually move through it back and forth. They're not, they don't have any dead ends. Creating bedding area. You're creating some thick cover around the edge like this so that deer can't stand here and see deer that are over here and you have that pressure. Now you pull bedding opportunity up around that food plot right around here. So you're taking some of these deer and you're relocating them for bedding down to that cover layer. Now, very important, you have a little hunting plot right here in between cover and food. Maybe you have another little hunting plot right here. Maybe you have a food plot trail up here going back and forth. Maybe you have a food plot trail here, right here or a hunting plot. Not a lot of food, but a lot of little areas. Those are all areas, does typically, they'll just come from the inside of the property, go straight to food, that's their afternoon activity. Bucks are the ones that circle around and go in. So a lot of these little food plots, and it might be you have some does here and they're traveling through over to here. The bottom line, they're traveling to that big food source. What does that do? That opens up those little food plots for yearning buck attraction. When you have multiple food sources, when you take larger food sources that you can count on major doe family groups taking over during the fall, when you have those small food plots off to the side that does just might pass through. I had a, I had a uh, plot in the UP of Michigan that came out of federal forest. So the deer are coming out of the federal land on the north. I had my private land, I had a little quarter acre food plot. I had a pinched off with a bunch of cuttings, narrowed it down to a pinch point to where I was, when I was on the stand in a cedar tree with my scent blown over the creek, that pinch point was only about 30 yards. Remember a doe and a fawn that would always take over that food plot, an older doe. Up there they could be eight years old, seven years old, 10 years old, but you wanted them because those does are the ones that actually live through the, the winter time. Here comes a little four point from the, from the top. He's a year and a half old buck. That mature doe would sit there and stare at him and stomp and even the little, her little fawn, the little, little stinker would go over there and stomp her foot just like mom was staring at that little buck. She even dominated that yearling buck. And you know what that yearling buck would do? He'd sneak over to the side, and when it looked like that doe was just about to come over and run him off the plot, he would run through from north to south so he could get to the big plot. That's how much dominance those doe have on those dispersing yearling bucks. Now, I had plenty of food sources in that property. I had eight acres of food, 14 different plots. Some of those plots were really small. It was crazy how I'd get pictures in December of three year and a half old bucks on a plot the size of a tenth of an acre, but that was their spot. And if they don't have their spot, no matter how small, no matter how lower quality, no matter how much less volume than that big giant plot, 
Even if the cover is not that great, it's just adequate. Even if it's open hardwoods, but they have their little corner, they'll stick. And folks, that's how you blow up your buck herd. You don't do it because deer are born on your property. If the mother's still around 90% of the time, those deer leave. If the mother's not around 70% of the time, those year and a half old bucks stay. Very, very important to understand that you're not gonna grow bucks on your property most often. And if you do, they're leaving. A lot of times if you're growing a lot of does, a lot of uh, bucks and doe fawns on your property, it's because you have fawning ground, you have too much food during the, the summertime. And what happens to all those young bucks? Because you have a lot of does, they're off your land. So you look for that balance. I always talk about there's a certain number of does that you can have on your land to reach a maximum amount of bucks that you have. Buck numbers here, doe numbers here, they come up. And this is really important. You know, you have right here, whatever that number is. I would say people ask me, and it's really hard, and people say, well, don't give me the PC answer. It depends on this and this and this, but it does depend on that. There's no set number of does. When I was in the UP of Michigan, I had ended up having 260 acres at one time, surrounded by public land, low quality public land. But I could have 15 to 20 does in and around that property that are using some of the public land, some of my land. And that reflected, you know, in 2006, we had 17 different bucks. And I'm talking 15 to 25, 20 to 25 does and fawns. So not, not even all does, there might be 12 does. Um, I ended up having a higher number of fawns per doe because I had quality fall forages, sent them to the deer yards with good food right in the fall time, which was more important than during the summer. They had more than, the, uh, more than they needed during the, the summertime. The critical needs were right before deer yarding time and then right after they got out. But I could have in an area like that, 260 acres, it might be 10, 12 does, the fawns, and then 17 different bucks that I get pictures of. That was in 2006. So that was about that maximum number right here. Whatever that number is, let's just say 15. So that to me will give you your maximum number of bucks. In that case, 17 was the most I ever saw on that property in 10 years. So that's optimum right there. What happens is if you increase the number of does, as you increase the number of does that relate to your property on a daily basis, or semi-daily, or semi-weekly, semi-monthly, whatever it is, your number of bucks decreases. When you have this optimum, they both meet. Does go up, bucks go down. Very important concept. If you have too many does, you're gonna repel those yearling bucks. If you have big, solid food sources and low quality cover, even if you're holding a lot of does there, you're gonna repel those yearling bucks. They are not gonna stick. Those yearling bucks just wanna have, or fawns, they wanna have a place that they can call their own and they're not pestered by female social pressure. And what's really cool is you think about that concept as a buck ages even as we humans age. You know, my dad passed away last October. Um, he was 81 years old, he would have been 82. And he, he would have been 82 just in a few days. And I, I talked about my mature buck uh, success by design that my dad, you know, the older he became, he loved playing games with us, he loved watching uh, sports, um, loved interacting with everybody, but of course he slowed down. And I feel myself slowing down and it's not, you know, I'm not that old, I don't consider myself old, but. It's just what happens. But as my dad aged, I noticed that he liked to have his alone time. He'd put his crossword puzzle on his knee and he'd pretend he's sleeping when we walked out there. And um, he just wanted to be left alone sometimes. He didn't want to be playing games. My, my mom would say, Dad, you know, Bob, get up here and play some games. And he'd say, ah, just not right now. And, and that's a mature buck. A mature buck, the older he ages. Imagine when he's a year and a half old, he's trying to get away from female social pressure, except for 10 days during the rut or a month, whatever it is, off and on. Um, they, only, they only breed two to four uh, does a year on average. So imagine that buck, as he's getting older, he looks for a more reclusive location in the woods to call his own to the point where when he's four, five, six years old, he's truly by himself. You hear about that old swamp buck? He's living in the swamp, he comes out, his legs are all dark and muddy. It, probably because he was pushed there. Not much food there, not much great cover. Might be just in a stand of sweet, uh, cedars. But bottom line, he could be left alone. And that is key all the way down to when he's a yearling buck. When he's a yearling buck, when he's a fawn buck, he can tolerate a lot more stress because I don't think he even understands the difference other than doe family groups, doe pressure, 
female social pressure, bad. Any moves. This is how you can create your property. Doesn't matter what shape, what size, make sure that you have your property fitting together. And oh, by the way, when you get all this together and you're, you're finding that balance of does and you're putting your habitat features together so they align, so you're collecting does here, bedding them here during the daytime and you leave room for small bucks, young bucks, old bucks, you blow it all up if you don't hunt it properly. So no matter what you do to your deer habitat, the lowest hole in the bucket always on hunting land is how you hunt it. And that's why most of the time, unless someone has a lot of hunting skill or a lot of hunting strategy and they have years of that and have shown that they have done it themselves, they have a very difficult time managing deer habitat because you can't manage deer habitat, you can't manage deer herds during the hunting season if you don't have that hunting background. No different than a major league baseball player trying to tell them how to bat when you didn't make it out of sixth grade t you know sixth grade t-ball or sixth grade baseball you have to have that experience and that has to be built into the plan and this will blow up and will not work this entire system right here doesn't work if you walk right through the middle to sit into a stand right here go out to a stand right here not going to work so you have to leave this alone you have to allow it to happen you have to find that balance you have to offer the good habitat and that's how you can collect those yearling bucks that are coming on your land. You can build your herd easily. That's what we do. I could care less how many deer during the summertime. I want to hold those, those bucks during the fall because I have scattered food sources, long food sources, food sources that from one end to the middle to the other end are hidden from each other. You can do that by lay of the land, by hills, by adding switchgrass breaks if you have to. Most of the time you don't because of the lay of land and corners that you can create on the land, even in flat areas, the cover that you have and then making sure that you offer bedding next to those food sources and then giving yourself an interior area where you can actually hold and collect bucks all the way up to maturity if you have enough room and you have enough depth of cover you can do it and really explode your buck herd this year just by aligning those pieces and leaving them alone and letting your land collect more than its fair share of dispersing yearling bucks this fall.